Bonsoir à tout le monde, à tous et à toutes. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm very glad uh, to welcome you here physically back again in our theater. I think it's actually the first event that we do uh, back in presence and also streamlined. Alors, bienvenue à tout le monde. Euh, je suis Giovanna Borazzi, directrice du Centre canadien d'architecture, et j'ai le plaisir d'introduire ce soir « Concevoir pour un avenir de soins, designing for a future of care euh, ». La soirée sera en effet en anglais, mais n'hésitez pas à poser votre question euh, en français. On va vous aider le, les speakers à répondre pour vous. Uh, I would like to begin by stating that the CCA is in the process of developing a long-term and in-depth land acknowledgement in collaboration with members of the Ganyanga Nation. We also recognize the many nations who are at the original inhabitants and caretakers of these lands and waters, which is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people. The CCA is a settler institution, and we are working towards fostering affirmative relationship with indigenous and other people across the Jodiaga, Monihang, Montreal. While the first phase of this project will be released in spring of next year, the CCA is committed to creating a living acknowledgement that will provide support and resources to indigenous community and researchers. So tonight we are here talking about care. And I would say there are very different ways of understanding the word of care. We can think of care as an attitude or a kind of psychic state to care about something or someone. We can think of care as an active attunement to life and society and support for whatever forms of life and society take. So caring for or taking care of something or someone. Or care, as more specifically understood, as a form of professional basis for human relationship, so healthcare workers or caregivers. So care relationships in society are become more and more pervasive, and because of aging population on the you know rising of, of um, economical challenge that push more and more people living together. Uh, so the question of care relationship is, I think, is central for our society to understand and to understand the opportunities that uh, this uh, different arrangement can offer, but also the support of different demographics. And architecture certainly can play a role in either work against or facilitate those relationships. And the ability of architecture to actually support this really depends on some of the so many societal factors that uh, are not conventionally considered part of, for example, of the discipline of architecture. So at the CCA, care has been a kind of central preoccupation for different projects we have been working on in the past and currently. So some years ago, we did an, a project that was called Imperfect Health that was a call for architecture to care not really to cure, so it was really meant to think of architecture as in, in those terms. And then the current project that you can see in, in the main gallery is the exhibition, a section of now, that is really a call for architecture to listen to how society is changing and what are the kind of new needs, and certainly think about the question of, of care relationship. So, Um, there are many projects that, for example, are shown in the exhibition, and I uh, just want to mention a few of them just to give a little bit a, a kind of framework also for tonight's discussion. So one, for example, is a, is a project by a group of architects in Berlin, Christoph Wagner Architecten, and it's called Lovo Lebenshort, and it's a housing that provides co-living housing units for LGBTQ people of all ages and all socioeconomic statuses. And, and is including floors where also there are elderly and in needs of, of special care. So again, it's a kind of architecture that is tuned and listening also of like a special or um, 
care of, of a kind of community that wants also to live together. But there are also projects that are looking at the question of care in, case, in question of um, precarious uh, condition for housing. So a project, for example, by Jack Self in London that look at um, new financial models where, where basically uh, people cannot afford to buy, will be able to rent because will, the rent will be measured to their um, income. So will always be kind of a proportion of, of their income instead of like being imposed by the real estate market. Or a project by, by some students inside the um, Frida Escobedo um, laboratory at the um, st studio at GSD, they are actually looking at the spaces for domestic laborers and, and how they are often marginalized in, in a typical apartment floor and uh, not treated with a kind of dignity. And this brings us to the main project we will focus tonight, a fantastic project uh, in, the, in the building, uh, the Care House by uh, architect Rafi Segal and artist um, and activist Marisa Moran-Yan. And it's a fantastic project that is in the exhibition and we will hear more uh, by them tonight. I think what I find is fantastic is that it's um, not only um, a very um, interesting project in terms of uh, architecture and its spatial and, and formal result, but is really establishing a kind of new, um, new model for thinking of what is a care relationship and somehow is leading the idea that, you know, in one projects, you can actually take care of the uh, elderly people or the, the people who need care, but at the same time solve uh, a kind of labor crisis that is connected to actually the ones who are giving the care. So I think it's leading in an idea that more and more architecture should actually try to things at simultaneously at the kind of needs and challenge that the society has in this moment. So there are very different ways of approaching and formalizing care. So we will hear tonight from, from different speakers. So that can be um, beside a kind of architectural response. There can be a question of policy, advocacy, design, as we said, and, and programming. And so I'm very pleased that we brought here together tonight a series of different uh, approaches that are complementary and interrelated and will help us to dig in more in this question of care. So beside Marisa Moranian and Rafi Segal, as I already mentioned, we have with us Dr. Patti Rios, the Executive Director of New Cities, and Greg Lindsay, Director of Applied Research at New Cities. So with no further delay, I want to invite all our speakers on this stage and uh, take it from here. Thanks. So to start, um, I'll go, then Rafi goes, and we'll jointly talk about Care House, and then um, you all will join us for the conversation. So to give you context, I'm an artist who works across photo, immersive installation, and moving image, trammeling the boundaries between the fantastical, the mythical, and its roots in the quotidian. And to disarm and open up space, my key tools are play, color, and humor. I co-design public art and creative media with new immigrants and working families. And as the daughter of Chinese and Ecuadorian parents, I'm interested in naming and giving shape to the nuances of immigrant experiences. So this is my grandmother and my child, and I feel really lucky to have had such amazing caregivers to look after them so that I could go back to work. 
And around the same time, which is now 11 years ago, members of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, a network of 10,000 nannies, housekeepers, and caregivers reached out to me to collaborate. And since that time, we've created new tools and what I would think are powerful imaginaries to shift how we see ourselves and how society values care. Our mobile studio, The Nanny Van, unpacked in public spaces, convening workers and employers to share stories and resources. And when The Nanny Van, born from seven junkyards, finally died, we created a new ride, The Care Force One. And my son, my team, and I traveled the country, the United States, uh, learning about solutions to the care crisis as we ourselves underwent a car crisis. So throughout this process, creativity and stories have been key to undergirding structural change. This is literally where the rubber meets the road, right? We pass a law, but this is only the beginning. Now we have to do our work to really get out there and educate employers educate uh, workers about their rights, and we can do it. I mean, creativity is really key to being able to reach people as well. So if you are just very grim and determined and you just talk about all the horrible things, you know, no one wants to be a part of that, really. So you need to bring in creativity to address those really important, urgent issues, but doing it in a way that really brings a lot of humanity to it. Can we have the sound up a little bit? You think you're alone in this world, right? You think that what you're experiencing is something unique and is only applied to you. But then when you have conversations and you build dialogue with somebody else, you realize, oh, this happens to you too. Right, and so that's one way to start consciousness, right? To create consciousness. Once here in Boston, I found myself working 80 to 90 hours a week, doing all the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry, taking care of the children, and worse, sleeping on a in-glass three-season porch with a bare concrete floor. They pay me only $25 a week. <clears throat> After one year, they gave me a raise of $35 and told me that I should be kissed the ground that they walked on. So in this piece that you see here, which is now on view at La Musée d'Art de Joliette, I chose to honor Natalicia Tracy, who you just saw, and her teammates at Boston's Brazilian Worker Center through the motif of the gladiolus, a flower that symbolizes strength and whose name come fr comes from the Latin word for sword. So among other accomplishments, these women have helped lead anti-trafficking, healthy workplace, and living wage initiatives. And I'm really excited to share with you the news that this fall, um, just about now, Natalicia was invited to serve as a senior advisor to labor to President Biden and VP Kamala Harris. So Natalicia is not able to join us tonight, um, but I'm, I thought that is something, a victory that we can all celebrate in. And so to give you context for the, United, the global dimensions of the United States curosphere, uh, of the 2.5 million domestic workers, 60% are immigrant and 90% are women. Many are struggling to feed their own families and regularly skip meals to make ends meet. Housing precarity is a top challenge. The low wages and high turnover endemic to the caregiving industry in the United States results in decline of consistent quality care. And so what this means on the other end for those who need care is that 90% of older Americans cannot afford any form of long-term senior care. And for both caregivers and care receivers, isolation is a top challenge. So I ask, how can we design in ways that improve upon the social determinants of health? And how can we design in ways that fundamentally transform housing 
and combine housing and care. And so I turned to my colleague, Rafi Siegel, for help to collaborate. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, so it, it's such fantastic work, and you know, uh, as an architect, uh, the medium that, that I operate in architecture and the city uh, are very slow. I've al always seen um, and believed architecture can, can carry uh, a social message, but the medium itself, the time of, of making buildings and, and having an impact is, is completely different. So we have competition, so at that time when Marissa approached me. I was interested in questions of how can buildings change uh, ideas or let's say notions of collectivity? How can the physical design make us understand um, different forms of public? Uh, this is a competition we won for the National Library of Israel. And here a building which um, try to kind of challenge the context or the place in which it was, or the publics in which, which it was supposed to serve or, or to, to create. A building which is completely horizontal, organized around clusters, around courtyards. You see the plan is an open plan and seamless. The ground breaks um, to, to a roof element and, and to a, a kind of continuous uh, floor plan. And, and very much in, in contrast, to the city Jerusalem where it's at, which is all about uh, physical segregation, barriers, separation, conflict, tension. So architecture here in a way, or a proposal as a kind of critique, right? Uh, but a critique through a social lens. And this is an important idea because then uh, it, it raises questions, what then you, what do you pick up on? What do you relate to? How do you begin to construct this narrative? Uh, whether you look at the landscape or whether you look at historic forms of spaces of gathering that, that come from kind of ancient uh, um, traditions. Uh, so uh, an idea or a search of a form for collectivity, as, as in this work. So this is something that I was looking in uh, through public buildings. But at the same time, also through my work at MIT, uh, with students we were looking at ways to engage a community or use the building to create a community. Uh, so students, uh, graduate students from MIT went to Kigali, Rwanda with uh, students from the University of Rwanda, with local masons, with villagers to build um, a new prototype for a village house. Uh, and this process, oh, here we go. So, so we, we worked on the design. Uh, we came with a kind of a model uh, of a sort. Uh, and, and we went there and, and we built it together. And as you can see that uh, kind of in this time lapse, not, nothing really much happens, you know? Uh, this is a, one more row of brick, one less row of brick, but it's not about that, it's about where the conversation happens, right? And, and how you can get people together around, around this idea of the building or around this um, condition of, in this case, the, the screen wall, eventually it did get built, uh, the, 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 that element which has a porosity between the inside and the outside of the village. And the villagers working on the, on the project were the neighbors. They, they kind of learned the skill, they got paid. So it was really revealing in a way to engage a community in actual architecture and actual building which took very quick to, to do. Part of this work uh, also involved a larger plan a larger urban plan, how do this kind of, the modernization of villages in this part of the world help um, bring in infrastructure, bring in new programs into the village. So my task was also to create a master plan or kind of an overall plan for, for this village to allow a health center, a handicraft center, a market, all these programs in. And this I took cue from work that I've been doing for over 15 years with kibbutz communities in Israel. And a kibbutz is um, historically a, a collective settlement uh, since a uh, generation already. It's been kind of erode and, and become more of a 
private-public partnership, but still land is collectively owned, although private uh, families build their own kind of homes. And in this uh, case, um, we developed a new kind of neighborhood with, with again, with the idea of a cluster uh, as a space of gathering, but on a smaller, on a smaller scale. So these ideas that uh, I, were work I was working uh, on, on various scales, across scales, uh, or, or the kind of the challenge in taking care and pairing it with housing and taking the idea of co-living, or we can say co-housing, of sharing, a sharing of space, yeah. And design has a, has a key role in, in, this, uh, in this ability for us to, to share a space, right? Luckily, in this kind of, it's not, it's not a two-legged uh, building, it's a three-legged <laughs> project with Ernst Valerie, who we, who we met by chance, but probably not by chance at all, in Baltimore. And he was developing a few row houses, uh, fixing them up, uh, buying affordable housing units, buying senior housing units, very socially aware. And he purchased um, a few abandoned houses in East Baltimore. Eventually, uh, through a long process, this developed into a design which we call Care House, which will, we will start construction this spring and it will open in 2013. Uh, and, and maybe here, um, what is Care House? What is this idea? Why does it look the way it looks? Uh, how does it work? How does it uh, organize itself? So, so maybe we can briefly describe what, what's... Um, how, how Care House works. Uh, you, um, we gather, uh, we identify, and we collect uh, or, or gather or interest elders from, from the neighborhood who uh, need care at different degrees. They pay into Care House. They receive housing, each uh, one with an independent unit that has all, all uh, whatever you need to, for a household. Uh, and they receive care. That, that fund that goes into the care house then pays a salary for a caregiver that lives in the same building on a separate floor in a separate unit, an independent unit. Uh, they get housing, which is subsidized, and they also, in that model, there is room for them to build equity, kind of to address the high job turnover. And this is happening in Baltimore in East Baltimore, in a neighborhood called Johnson Square. And you see this map, and we kind of nickname it the butterfly effect. The buildings in purple are abandoned buildings, vacant lots. There's a whole history why this happened here. Um, but you see our side is kind of on the edge of that, uh, which explains uh, the need, or at least in this community, uh, the real need for one affordable housing and affordable care. Uh, and, and along the corner, which is, again, a very important urban condition of the corner block in the context of, of the American city, but specifically in the context of Baltimore, which is a main kind of uh, avenue which the city wants to invest in. So that's also another important thing. We're not operating in a vacuum. The city is interested in how to um, instigate and how to find the right catalyst to develop the, the neighborhood. And Care House sits right at that corner of Greenmount Avenue, which is this potentially commercial corridor. And one of the streets that goes between the, the wings of the butterfly that I showed you and the kind of more well-to-do neighborhoods in the center. Right? Uh, so the, the, the corner condition is where kind of eyes are needed. If you do something significant on the corner, then it kind of uh, impacts the, the surrounding. And so the idea was to start developing, in a way, an architectural language for this building that, that kept, that held that corner on the one hand, but also expressed some kind of a sense of uh, individuality, perhaps, a sense of um, contemporary design. You know, not like anything that an old people's home would look like. Uh, and the big windows act as these kind of uh, windows to the street, right? Eyes to the street. It's kind of that engagement. But then on the other side of that same block, we have an alley, an alley which is kind of neglected. So the back side opens up uh, and makes something out of that leftover as a kind of courtyard. 
that faces a, a kind of small pocket park. So again, a design process of how do you express that condition through the form, how do you break up and open the building into that condition, and how you translate that into materiality, into windows, through a whole process of back and forth, and this is already more than a year old, my God, um, of comments from, uh, from community members, from doctors, from caregivers, and bring that into a design, which you see a section here, and the pink uh, represents the, the, the shared spaces, as I described, uh, the units of, of care house, the individual units, are organized in the periphery. And in the center, there is a courtyard. And on each level, there is a different kind of shared space, whether it's a kitchen, which is a lounge in this case, a kitchen, uh, and a terrace, a kitchen not only where caregivers would prepare food for, for the community, for the elders and the caregivers living in the building, but also watch over each other's kids. That's another kind of factor that, that we can talk about, that care, once it's in place, is not only caregivers to elders, but it's elders watching kids, caregivers watching each other's kids, kids and elders, so it becomes intergenerational. It becomes like that organically through a design that eliminates corridors and basically says, this is a shared space, for everyone, and you enter your units from this space. And each floor has its own activity and is designed for those activities. And everything is open to light, and this kind of west-south facing uh, facade with the terraces really brings in uh, light and air into, into that uh, center space. So here, again, is where we start with, with uh, art, or with social art, or with, with act, activism in, in, in filmmaking, in dance, in storytelling. We develop a design which is more, let's say, like a framework, a physical kind of framework, organized around these shared spaces, and, and then kind of art comes in again, now with another kind of role, as each of these floors, and you kind of now begin to understand the, the image that we started with, has a theme, has a story, has other kind of components. And so, you wanna <laughs> talk about that. Yeah, so I wanna back up for a second, also mention that, um, because I, I think sometimes if someone's introducing a new kind of typology, it's helpful it sometimes takes a couple of different voices to understand what exactly it is. So Care House, we say, is the U.S.'s first uh, intergenerational care-based co-housing project. To give you an idea about the timeline, we opened doors in 2023, and as Rafi was describing, uh, we have rooms for independent units for 17 older and disabled adults, and for four caregivers and their children. And then the, um, the spaces and the floor plans that Rafi was just describing um, are, you know, if so, for those who are listening in or joining in as listeners, if you're not attuned um, to floor plans, some of the things that make it different are that it's pandemic friendly, there's not tight corridors. Um, and it's optimized to be able to look after, there's a lot more communal space, the floor print and the, the square footage is dedicated to a lot of communal space, more so than is normally allocated. So what we're designing against is the institutional feel in the United States of senior housing, which is repetitive and for me is my worst nightmare. Um, and so against this institutional feel of senior living decor, we're designing things with slight adjustments. So for example, the unique designs on each floor um, assist in wayfinding and memory boxing. Uh, in this first floor, we are honoring Clarice Castor, who is a domestic worker, a mother, and an anchor to the Haitian American community around her. So she's the kind of person who would open up her kitchen and cook more food that she needed, and she would make sandwiches for the Haitian American garbage truck drivers, and she cleaned houses, uh, she cleaned rooms in the Howard Johnsons, and she saved her, among the other four jobs that she had, 
and the other, the three boys that she raised, and she saved money in her mattress to be able to loan out to um, the people who needed it, who couldn't get a loan from the bank. Uh, so the lioness is a symbol of family pride, and in Clarice's case, uh, extended family pride, and the tulip is a symbol of love, which originates from Uzbekistan and Central Asia before traveling to Amsterdam and Europe, and then the New World. So it's as diasporic as the domestic workers comprising our global curosphere. So here in the corner, we see various caregivers and advocates, some of them who you saw in the films that I was showing earlier, who've helped shape our work. And we also see Billie Holiday, who was a, a domestic worker like her mother, and whose voice transforms indignities into aspirations. So my process almost always starts with people, and to make sense of their stories, I make artifacts along the way. And to me, art codifies these stories of solidarity. And here we see Bruce Lee, who galvanized not only Asians, but blacks, whites, and Latinx communities. So, so the idea, as you saw in, in the kind of the drawing of the five floors and the shared spaces, uh, each, one, each floor then gets a story, gets a color, gets a whole set of materials, you know, and, and for people kind of that have maybe orientation problems, so you know if you're on the yellow floor or the red floor, but also it's how colors meet, how the floor and the wall meet, which helps vision loss uh, and, and helps um, even sometimes kind of lip reading in, in some cases. Uh, that's adding something so significant to a design which is lacking. In addition, we wanted to show that all the other aspects in terms of the ergonomics and the and the space design of elements, of factors, are also introduced in, into care house, and more so an awareness that even, you know, the use of color on certain handles in, in your bathroom is also important to, for those with, with vision loss. So the whole thing is designed, whether it's flooring that, that gives you a sense of where you are, or colors, or an ability to, to, to sit near, near a sink, uh, so, so care house is designed with all that in mind. And the other component, uh, and now we're taking uh, the, the art to the, back to the outside of the building, um, is really kind of a work in progress, but is, is transforming the whole corner, which in Baltimore has a whole tradition of the corner shop, the corner retail. So we have a retail on, on the corner, but right next to it, the entrance to the house, and. Uh, and the entire facade is shaped through um, a perforated system that is drawn on. And you can explain a little bit what the idea there is. Right. So I, I will, about the vision loss point, for me it's a very personal issue because we have glaucoma in my family. And so um, my bag is red, my phone is red, my, a lot of the things I wear are red because when I wake up my, my vision is poor enough, it's correctable at this point. But um, but I can, I can see things that are best in red. So like you see on that image back there, there a lot of the handles, for example, were red, um, which I can see without my contact lenses. So the lighting is an interesting question. And when, so the care house is also responding um, to um, a existing uh, vision plan that was developed by residents of Johnson Square, that immediate, that neighborhood. Um, and one of the things that we heard over and over again was there um, in this historically divested neighborhood was the need to bring people onto the street and to have eyes on the street. And everyone kept on saying that they wanted lights and everyone said they wanted screens, but screens and um, they're actually at this point, technically they're difficult to integrate in an interesting way architecturally. And so we're thinking through this question of lighting and how to bring people on the street so there's more people on the street, right? So um, uh, these are some of the rough prototypes that I was, created, was creating and thinking about the lighting conditions and how to make it so, um, yes, functionally bringing people on the street, lighting up the corner, but then also how do you transform a... Um, building, um, so, I mean, in my, intro, in my work so far, right, it's like a, a decade's worth of work with domestic, domestic workers, right, and we're really intentionally creating a lot of ephemeral projects that can break up and um, set up and break down very quickly, also in part because we have um, 
we're working with a lot of folks who are uh, undocumented immigrants. And so there's this need for dexterity and to negotiate visibility. Um, and, you know, Care House also comes from this interest of, um, well, as Rafi alluded to earlier, you know, um, art can be nimble and quick to respond to its political circumstances, design a little slower. There's a lassitude in architecture, but it also offers a certain permanence. And so my interest in this exploration, or one of them, is how can we transform the culture of how we care through architectural and civic and urban scale projects um, that, you know, when we, mostly when we, when we think of amazing, fantastical architecture, we don't, it's not usually associated with senior housing, but how could we bring that, um, that sexiness to uh, the space of aging? So here, these are, again, this is looking at um, daylight conditions, these are looking at night, light, uh, night conditions, and thinking about this kind of jewel box effect that we can achieve. Um, some tests that we are doing, and here, this is an, another prototype where we're thinking through the, the perforations and like what can kind of glow through and emerge. Um, so with Care House Baltimore, you know, we're in conversation with developers and stakeholders and um, municipalities about what Care House would look like in other locations. Baltimore, we would like to think of as the first. Um, so Care House Baltimore is a standalone building, but what does it look like if it's a plug-in that gets integrated into a block tower with our changing conditions? Um, and, or what does it look like on an urban scale? And so at the, con at the invitation of, well, I mean, as Ernst and Rafi and I are thinking through and making Care House Baltimore, we're really aware of the conditions that we're encountering and policy opportunities that could really transform and enable us to scare, scale what this strategy that we call care-based co-housing. So at the invitation of MIT Washington, um, and a research team, um, we published a paper that outlines five infrastructure-oriented policy recommendations that would able, enable us to scale this strategy. Um, so this paper has been circulated to members of Congress as well as advisors in the Biden and Harris administration, um, and it points out how few key tax credit amendments and infrastructural allocations can significantly help mitigate our nation's senior housing and care crisis. Thank you very much. And now we have the conversation. Is this yours? Uh, this is the address. Oh, right, yes, you're right. Yes, Patty goes. Oh, so. Oh, great. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful and inspiring presentation. Um, my job now, uh, well, first of all, I'm Patty Rios. I'm the Executive Director of New Cities Foundation. We are a non-for-profit organization based in Canada. And our focus is to, um, to shape inclusive, more inclusive, healthier, and more resilient cities. And we do this through uh, curating events, through uh, meaningful engagement, through research, and also through our unique editorial platform that brings people from all across the world, forward-thinking people that are trying to build more connected, more healthier, inclusive cities. So my job right now is going to try to be to connect what is happening in the US and this amazing project and what is happening in Canada, across Canada, as we try to emerge from this pandemic and how it is connected to the policy level, how it's connected to the design things that we need to be uh, taking care of, how it's connected with collaboration pieces. So bear with me and let's make us take a small glance at history. For centuries, humans have lived in communities. In general, historians and anthropologists agree that the first time people lived in purposeful built communities was just after the integration or the invention of agriculture. 
However, evidence shows that it was long before this when we were gatherers and hunters that a few dozen people would live together and rely on their skills and different abilities. There was diversity, and actually this was considered an asset. Well, as much diversity that it could be with this hunting and gathering groups. But something interesting to note is that they were moving away from hierarchical structures and authoritarian approaches so that there could be more equalitarian, more horizontal approaches to dividing food and, resor and material resources. Now let's jump back into modern day. The truth is that no matter how much technology we develop and resources we adopt so that we can use in our daily lives, we continue to be social beings with the need to see ourselves reflected in others, to see and to be seen. It is through community life that we learn from each other and that we become resilient to face the challenges that the world right now is facing. Living in a community and further being committed to our community is not something that we do out of convenience. There's actually, it's actually one of the most important drivers of happiness. Psychologist Elizabeth Dunn says that giving to others is actually one of the things that can make us happier. And it's just not giving to others in the sense of donating money, but actually help them achieve what they could be their better selves and help them achieve thriving lives. That is what Care House is doing. It provides a space, an opportunity that brings people together to live in a community and help each other to have healthier, happier, thriving lives. So the question is, how does this fit into the larger picture? Why is it important to recognize the Care House effort and showcase the handle of initiatives across Canada and the world that are bringing people together and tackling the challenges communities face today? There is a simple answer. We need to rethink the way that we are designing our homes. It's been a long time since we, we questioned ourselves that. And the last time that we checked how we wanted to live was in a post-world war, uh, post war world when we were trying to build suburban environments where we would provide people that, were, um, that had got, gone to war a quiet, a secluded environment to recover from all of the trauma. This is not the case right now. We are living in a different reality. So as we address the long-standing challenges and pressing issues that emerged from the pandemic in Canada and cities across the world, it is important to understand how advocating and building for housing for care that brings people together can change our lives. So I wanna focus on three main challenges that have been identified in several studies and some of them have been exacerbated by the pandemic. The first one, and we are no strangers to this one, housing affordability crisis. On average, Canadians spend up to 45% of their income in housing and from four Canadians that might wanna get a house, only one is gonna be able to buy one. The issue of loneliness and social isolation, we know that this is increasing. In Canada, 30% of the senior population are at risk of experiencing social isolation. And in a study conducted by the Vancouver Foundation found that one in every four residents is feeling isolated and alone. This of course leads to mental health challenges, depression, and suicidal. The third one, we know that cities across the world face a, a drastic increase in terms of aging population. Five years ago, seniors represented in Canada just 15% of our population. In five years, it's gonna be 25% of the population. How are we envisioning our housing to move towards that? So the bad news is that these three challenges are connected. And the good news is that these three challenges are connected. Care House addresses all of these three challenges. These are the types of solutions we need to promote. However, the only way to replicate these efforts is to take action and prioritize policy and design that enables housing for care. So there are three priority actions that I want to bring into the table so that we can further discuss and that you can also take home and, and kind of like analyze and reflect on this. The first one is to promote affordable housing throughout the overall housing continuum. We know that more affordable housing is needed, but it's not just going it's not going just um, to do it if we build market housing. We also need transitional housing, supportive housing, below the market, and a wide array of affordable options that allow people to rent, rent to own, co-own, live together, such as co-ops, um, co-housing, and co-living. These are excellent examples that enable people to feel more connected and to be more resilient. The second one is fairly simple, but it's often forgotten, especially by architects and designers. Build homes with different numbers and of rooms 
and that also enable flexibility so that we can actually transform our house as an aging place. Maybe generous living rooms where a space can be transformed into a nursery, a studio that becomes a room, or vice versa, a bedroom that later on becomes a hobby or music room. Just imagine, for an instance, if during the pandemic we could have a lock of a lock of unit that would be transformed into a unit that was housing a person that was recovering from surgery, or that person that was coming back from undergrad studies because they needed to come home, or maybe we would have a space that was temporarily a daycare. Just imagine what the world could be. The third one, which enables the previously mentioned strategies, is increasing density in areas previously zoned for single family homes. This is a conversation that cities across Canada are having. Besides providing more options to live in central neighborhoods that are connected to public transport, to services, to parks, to um, daycare, to schools, it also enables to stop, us, to stop sprawl. It aligns with climate change actions, and it also honors reconciliation efforts. Neighborhood intensification, while least contested in some communities, is one of the first steps we need to take to stop expanding into territory where indigenous populations reside and have their communities. If we focus on building the famous missing middle that includes triplexes, townhomes, um, uh, sorry, row apartments, and three, or three to four story buildings, then we will be able to move into a direction where we address the previously mentioned challenges. Montreal has, has actually great examples of this missing middle. So just to wrap up, I, I wanna leave you with this idea. Uh, for, for, for years, Planners have been focused on public space. That is a space that bring people, brings people together, that connects each other, that allows us to be more resilient, to uh, express the way that everything that we might be thinking about politics and how we live. However, today we need to unlock the potential of housing. Throughout the pandemic, we are, we are realizing that we are spending not eight or 10, 13 hours in our homes, but up to 24 hours. So how is housing going to shift so that we can start addressing these different needs? Besides CareHouse, there are projects across Canada that bring people together and celebrate the differences. Whether it is the case of Toronto's 60 Richmond Cooperative that brings together frontline workers and provides support through a training center and multiple shared space that helps build community. Or maybe Sixth Street, a development in New West in British Columbia, bringing together Swahili and indigenous populations because the culture sometimes overlaps and they can build on the strengths as well. Maybe it's Cohere, housing, Cohere, a multi-unit development house, uh, of housing in Vancouver, that it's one of the most affordable and successful projects that facilitates a sense of community. And it brings families and people who were transitioning out of homelessness. Another one that I wanna mention is the 13th level social housing building that is being built as well in Vancouver, designed by women and for women addressing the needs of women that have pleaded violence and that are single parents. Over the years, I've learned and witnessed how the way that we design our homes has the power to connect us, to enable healthier lives, to have more inclusive environments, and to have more resilient communities. So let's take the leap and redefine the design of our homes. Today, we begin to imagine housing that prioritizes care and community life. We can make this happen if we work towards together towards the dream that you, towards the, towards the city that we are dreaming of. So, thank you. to Rafa Marissa, which, uh, which building off Patty's comments there about basically um, 
best principles for expanding housing. Uh, obviously, Care House in Baltimore is a single standalone sort of mid-rise, but I know the two of you have developed plans or thought about how Care House could manifest within high-rises across neighborhoods at various scales. And I was hoping that the two of you could talk a bit more about that, about how we could imagine not just a single uh, you know, Care House building, but Care House communities and rethink what it is the model of, of senior urbanism, right? Like, you know, we have naturally occurring senior communities in housing projects, particularly across the United States, um, but this offers a model there. And so, you know, how, what is the intersection? I guess, I guess, Rafa, we'll start with you since you are the, the, the more of an architect of the two architects in that setting. You know, a city that um, uh, seniors are happy and, and maybe children as well, right? If we, if we take care of that, if seniors and, and kids are happy, then, then we, we did something right. Uh, scaling up uh, is something that uh, in our world is uh, a desire of, uh, in, in let's say the capitalist market, is something that we're, we're kind of relying on. Uh, high tech companies, technology, every, everyone is relying on the ability to scale up, right? That's kind of how you make money also. I, I would say the importance is not, not to scale up, but to find ways to maintain a certain scale that that we can not control, but that could be that the, the people that are part of Care House, whether it's a building or a block, I wouldn't go as far as kind of a city, um, feel more more in control of their environment and more safe in their environment. Right? That's that's a challenge, and the ch it's a challenge not only of architecture; it's a challenge, of course, of how we organize communities and how we bring communities into the design project. Uh, but that's, um, that has to do, and, and let me just say one more word in, in that context because it's, it brings me to what Patty, what you were saying. It's a question of how we build, you know? Because how do we build today? How, how do homes get built today? Um, mostly private development. Private development that builds to sell, speculative development. And when you build to sell, you're taking a risk. Uh, you want to make sure that what you build will sell, so you look at what the market already kind of proven, or, or what was already sold. And so you know, oh, this sold, well, it's a sure bet. I will build more of that, three bedrooms, which is the most built and the least needed. Uh, I will build more of that because I know that's sold. And we, we can't go anywhere if we don't break that model. We have to come up with alternative models of who builds. And because who builds depends on what are the kind of interest factors, desires, needs that are completely different, but we, we have no power, right, to, to, to make that happen, or, or very little. So this is part of a bigger project. The bigger project here is to find a way to empower or to develop other economies and other ways to, to, to build our cities. Indeed. Um, I, I said, there, there's a lot to that, and I also I want to go to Giovanna next year, because we talked about, obviously, senior care, mostly with Care House in this. And I should note, just as a bit of context, I should have felt like I should have started with this, but like, obviously the crisis of care during the pandemic, uh, and, and Giovanna, I think, commented upon this to a bit, but like, here in Canada, of course, 80% of the deaths in the earliest wave of the pandemic happened in Canada's senior homes. Uh, it was 40% in the United States, and you know, in the United States, uh, at the opposite of the age spectrum, children, you know, basically half of almost all child cares were due to close in the United States. It was an economic collapse of the model. And we're having this conversation, so I'm going to to Giovanna with the child care aspect of this, because here in Quebec, I think 11,000 workers are on strikes at the moment, or they were on strike a few days ago. 400 of the garteries have closed, uh, and so we've seen parents, uh, you know, are suffering a crisis of care as we speak in this. And um, I, I guess, Joe, I'd love your thoughts on this from the, again, from the sort of Montreal context of this and the Quebec context of this about, you know, how do we address the sort of policy conundrums and architectural conundrums for childcare at the other end of the Gardnery system and how we can do all of that? Because I find it fascinating as an, as an American emigre here that I was drawn to Montreal in part because of the promise of childcare. And Prime Minister Trudeau has, of course, talked about expanding this model, but even here it's in crisis to an extent, a financial crisis, a uh, crisis of work, and perhaps a crisis physically as well, too. So I'm curious your thoughts on this about how do we solve it at the other end as well. Care House is providing a, a senior model. I'm curious in the course of curating the section now whether we've seen models for how to care for our children as well, uh, you know, from a professional caregiver context. Um, 
Thanks a lot for your, your question, your thoughtful question. And I think uh, one of the points that uh, both Rafi and Marisa are making with this project is that you, you might want to think not one solution, but several solutions. So you, you, you should really think, um, you know, every opportunity that you have. So if here you are, you know, your primary goal is maybe the elderly, at the same time you are thinking, okay, with these women that are take, you know, giving cares where, where they are putting their children. And so ultimately there will be someone else who have to take care, while they're giving care, there's someone else who have to take care of their children. And, you know, in the exhibition we have, for example, a series of photographs of, um, you know, a new uh, things that is happening, for example, in the States, it's like this 24 hours daycare where, you know, people have multiple jobs and, or night jobs, and, and so kids are, are, you know, placed in, in this kind of care. But again, is like, is like the kind of work condition we currently have now are just creating this fact that um, you need care. Everyone needs care. Like if you work at a family, you need the care, and then there is someone else who will give care, and they will need caregivers to their own family and so on. So it's kind of like weird chain that we are um, putting together, and 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 yet I think the yeah architecture and policies can can come in, and I think. Um, yeah, I think here in Quebec we have on paper one of the kind of best <laughs> um, policies for for uh, um, child child care, but we also know that it's not enough, and there are more more kids and more um, that what this structure can can offer. And so um, I think this solution will be probably multiply those opportunities, but also looking for hybrid solution like the one of the care house is proposing. So where from the beginning, the question of multi-generation is, is taken in account and is, is, these groups are not managed separately somehow. So it's not you are only thinking of elderly care, but you are thinking of childcare at, at the same time. And I think we see more and more at this kind of multi-generational model as, as a kind of answer um, of, of, of care somehow. No, absolutely. I would say tw uh, 24 hour daycare. I remember the, the photos in the galleries, and yes, it, it struck me at the time, of course. That the, of course, the reason we have 24 hour daycares is because of the zero hour scheduling practices that have become that. And, and even then, again, the lesson of the pandemic of, of us who are parents having children at home being forced to work the exact same work schedules because capitalism gave us no respite even during a pandemic and even with our children out of school. So the, the reaction of all these structures to the demands of work and capital and everything else, of course. I feel it's like underlies all of this. Patty, I want to turn to you on this because uh, this week at New Cities, we hosted the latest episode, our season finale of our podcast uh, with Alexander Lang, uh, the design critic, author of The Design of Childhood, uh, who wrote a piece recently about care and the notion of care in design, talking about this. And she mentioned uh, Justin Garrett Moore, uh, now I believe with the Kaiser Foundation, urban planner, who proposed a department of care for New York City, and this has been moved for others. And, I'd be curious your take on this about how we can think about all of this holistically, from not just from a design standpoint, uh, but how perhaps governance models might work on this. You know, there have been, I know Vienna, for example, had a deputy mayor in charge of thinking about the design of the city for women. Um, you know, I think Alexandra proposed in her book that, you know, there should be a kid mayor, as she put it, not a mayor who's a child, but a mayor in charge of children and thinking through the design issues for children. And I'd be curious your thoughts too about are there, are there, are there interesting proposals or how can we holistically think about this or which departments to integrate to start, you know, to promote these kinds of solutions in addition to the housing policies you recommended as well? That, that's a good question, Greg. Um, I actually have to be honest and I go like back and forth in between having a department for care or thinking specifically about building for care. And just the reason is that it takes so long. I mean, you were talking about how art can be so immediate in terms of like kind of like bringing up um, issues or addressing challenges or taking a standpoint about something that is happening. And then architecture takes so much time. And then policy, we jump into another level in terms of the lifetime of how long it takes a project to actually happen, a policy initiative. So what I would say is, I think that there's an underlying answer to care and it's enabling communities to come up with the responses that they need. So yes, definitely it's important that we start thinking about caring, housing for care, caring communities, but what does that mean? What do we actually mean by care? 
Is it about um, being empathetic to each other? Is it about supporting each other? Is it about the lifetime of a project as well, including the maintenance, what's gonna happen afterwards in terms of like when we're talking about public spaces, when we talk about care, it actually is about who is going to be responsible for taking care of that magnificent space that the community created. So I think that, the, that, there's, a, that there's a leverage point that goes beyond and is overarching to care to um, a, a, a department that is uh, designing for women by women, for instance, and it's about enabling the community. So building on what Marisa is saying, each community is going to have their own needs and their own, their own expectations, their own priorities to address. If we somehow find a way to craft in policy, and I know that I'm like shooting for the magic wand here, <laughs> but if we find a way to craft policy that is actually going to allow communities to get organized and to create frameworks, but not specifically outcomes or targets, but frameworks where the own community can enable or suggest their outcome, then I think that we're gonna be more moving not just into more caring communities, but into more equitable communities as well. Thank you. Right. Yes, and I had one more question for you before we go to the audience. So start thinking about your questions, because just a second, but please, and then I have a follow-up for you. Well, I love what you said about designing frameworks and not outcomes. And um, in, in this conversation, I've been thinking also, for example, Giovanna, you were, you were talking about redundancies in care and care networks and care grids. And then um, I was thinking about this other kind of abstracting a different, like a lot of times when people are thinking about care, they think about child care, elder care. It sounds very singular, but then also, thinking about designing redundancies in the network is a different kind of strategy that shifts. And then the other thing is recursive care. So for example, there's um, uh, one of my collaborators um, is Sarah Santin and her initiative at Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore. Um, she's a dean of the School of Nursing and um, she does a lot of work about, um, well, enabling older and disabled adults to meet their own self-determined mobility goals. And one of the things that she points out um, that I think is really profound is how a, uh, they look at and provide capacity support for individuals who, well, many different kinds of individuals, but uh, low, low income um, specifically, but oftentimes um, when they're enabling and providing support to an individual, how they can and, and, and the ways in which they are already um, caring for others that are either younger or older or have different um, abilities. So there's a kind of a recursive care, right? So if you capacitate and empower somebody who then is, um, you get this kind of chain. Um, yeah, this is. There's, there's a lot, you can keep going that direction. Well, I wanna, I wanna shift your gears there in a second as well in the sense of before we go to the audience. Um, uh, you know, you of course mentioned, you know, you're talking to various U.S. policymakers in this, and, you know, I, I would normally joke, I guess I will joke, that, you know, the solution to all this is to inject a large amount of public funding into all of these models, which is actually, potentially, might actually happen if the U.S. reconciliation bill passes, in which President Biden has argued that, you know, care is infrastructure there. So my question for you, Marissa, is like, is, is yes, is how, you know, Rafi showed a diagram briefly, I would love to hear from you, Rafi, as well on this, but, you know, how, how do we have this pencil out, uh, you know, at, at scale, particularly given the level of care and programming involved, and, and how replicable that model is beyond just simply large injections of public funds, which I'm supportive of. And then second, uh, you know, you showed briefly sort of four areas there. Where, where, what do you think is the best lever for this? How, how do we hack that system, or where are the points of pressure to sort of create models like CareHouse, including CareHouse there, in terms of where those funds can be redirected, or, or how do we think about this systemically? Because otherwise, we're still operating within that straitjacket of development economics, and will be after, you know, whatever that stimulus passes in the United States, and then of course here in Canada, you know, the new Trudeau government is trying to wind down the measures it passed during the stimulus, so there's gonna be even less potentially on the table. So yeah, so we'll, I guess what would you do with, you know, a trillion dollars, Marissa, go. Well, um, one of the things that we researched and we were writing about was, um, I, and I'm gonna situate my response in the context of the United States. Um, but one of the largest sources of public subsidy for developers is what's called LIHTC, or a Low Income Housing Tax Credit, wherein if you, you can apply for government subsidy, if you're um, creating a new building that has X number of units that are affordable and accessible, but one key loophole is that you, um, right now the way the laws are written, 
um, would exclude developers from including a, a, the unit of a caregiver to be included among the tax credits. So essentially, they're not incentivized to build units for caregivers, and that is something that's it's interesting because it, it's an existing legislation. You don't so like if you're passing a new legislation and you're crafting the legislation, that's a lot of capital and resources to do that kind of effort. But if you're changing existing measures, it's a little bit easier because you're just making a tweak. So that's one loophole. I think another thing that needs to, what I would like to see is money that goes to new prototypes um, for seeing and carrying out these different examples and money to, and support to examine and, and um, do the quantitative and qualitative analysis to um, indicate measures going forward that are important. So I'll kick it to you. Do you want me to answer? Sure, Rafi, if you have thoughts I mean, on this too, I mean, you, you obviously thought about this. No, I, 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 okay, I would then completely agree with the, with the pilot concept, that if we could just allocate a little bit of funds to try out different housing models, you know, and, and uh, it, it's, it's really not much, but to create that space in our cities to try different housing, whether it's care houses or others, or whether it's even different kinds of co-living or different kinds of affordable units, to try them out because they can then prove themselves and even the market could kind of work with, with, that, with those models. It's very easy and, and really it's not costly. I mean, you think of all the, the kind of silly apps that so many millions go into and we get them on our phones and they don't work and we kind of drop them. What is, you know, to do a few buildings is really not, not much. Uh, it's just a, someone needs to take the initiative and, and understand the value of it. Can I, can I add yes, quick please, please, please. I would say I'll ask you both as well. Go ahead. Um, I, I want to add actually one component that would be amazing if we could destine also that trillion or I don't know how, how much money you were offering us, Greg, uh, to invest in different um, approaches for housing care would be how, like I, I'm just going to bring the informality card, like coming from Mexico and knowing that Childcare and care overall is not something that the government actually is providing or is in charge of institutions, but you have to come up with it as a family. So what if you enable families so that you can also create this um, approach in which you can support each other? I know that in Mexico during the pandemic, families would come together so that like five families would be like uh, sharing the schoolwork, for instance, for five kids. And they would create bubbles. So this is something that was organized in probably two or three weeks. It didn't need more. But what is the government's, what is the government's um, responsibility in terms of supporting that kind of efforts that are also actually coming from the community and that can be more sustainable? Because I don't completely agree with building more housing typologies. However, if we are not looking at the programming, at the maintenance, how this is going to be sustainable and how it is going to be adopted by communities, and if we are just building on, for instance, data, we know that data is something that is very biased. It's great, it helps us understand how people are moving, but it doesn't help us understand what are the needs, the underlying needs. So in that terms, we need to go into the qualitative data so that we start understanding the stories and give more impact actually to the stories and not just build on the metrics and rough data that, that is happening. But just going back to that point, it's about understanding how this overall housing typologies might be addressing the needs that are coming that are being piloted by the community. So what about community piloting some of these programs so that then developers and architects can respond to it and then build integrated groups collaborating private sector, community, public, so that we can come up with great solutions. Before I go to the audience, do you have any additional thoughts? Because I, I was thinking of this too, and, and again, in the context of Montreal and as a Montreal institution, I mean, Mayor Plant just, rec just re-elected, of course, um, and of course, housing, the number one issue in the recent mayoral elections. Uh, I mean, Montreal already has on paper a very progressive housing policy by the standards of North America. Uh, and yet, you know, it's still not enough and still gentrification is happening and still there is a housing crisis here. And so I'm curious if you have any particular thoughts, again, in the context of a section of now about whether the, whether the administration has, has toured this, spoken to you, thoughts in it, or how they might implement some of the ideas both presented on stage tonight, but also some of the other co-housing models that are featured in the exhibit there too. How, how might Montreal adopt some of these ideas uh, as part of its own housing goals? Well, the, you know, our role as an institution here is really to, to bring all these uh, ideas and hope that, uh, yeah, kind of <laughs> brings uh, architects here or elsewhere to kind of really reflect on these uh, different models. 
But I think uh, beside the kind of different housing types, the question of aff affordability will be really the kind of key thing in the future and, and really think of like, um, yeah, models where uh, we should not assume that you can actually own anything and, and therefore if you cannot own, not own, you know, uh, one solution is to reduce everything. So this kind of, uh, everybody's speaking about this tiny house or kind of going back to a kind of existence minimum and so on, but reducing size is not, is not a solution either in terms of kind of quality of what we were discussing before and kind of long term. Um, demographic is changing, there are more people living alone, so that is also more expensive for a person because then means, uh, yeah, not sharing. And so I think many of the models here, maybe some are too also, I don't know, radical, and maybe it's not easy to, or maybe there's not the context, but really questioning the, the yeah, really pointing out the question of affordability, I think for me will be the future. And I think for Montreal, certainly crucial uh, in continuing to be a city that is actually affordable where you can have a mix of population and it's not gentrified in a way that you know certain population is just put it, pushed to the edges. Um, so I think there are already kind of cooperative and, and kind of uh, different models but I think the idea will be to really push that uh, even more. Yeah. All right, well, there before we go to the audience, I will quote Naomi Klein quoting Milton Friedman that, you know, in a crisis, policymakers turn to the ideas that happen to be lying on the ground. So it's important to seed ideas like Carehouse now for the crisis as it deepens. Um, all right, audience questions. And I would say level of a disclaimer here as well. As you can tell, I'm an American Anglophone, but we are, of course, delighted to accept questions in French and welcome any Francophones with questions. Um, any questions from the audience? We have yeah. about... Ten minutes left. I can keep going. I see one over here, please. I'm going to. Oh, the microphone works perfectly. Wonderful. <laughs> and no I have wonders. two questions online as well. Thank you. Great. We'll t happily take your questions online. Thank you all for who are tuning in from afar. Um, thanks for the really inspiring presentation. It was really great. Um, I think it's interesting to talk about innovation and ideas and where the money comes from. And I'm curious because in Quebec we tend to rely a lot on government funding to provide universal programs for childcare, for senior care, for anything that's affordable, it tends to be with government money. Government and innovation don't normally go together that well. Um, so I'm curious, uh, just in, the, in terms of care house, how did you manage to do something that's so innovative and inspiring and keep it affordable? You wanna, uh, I, yeah. I, I'm just I mean, thinking. I so, I mean, I will say that for us, we we first started in envisioning Care House, and we spoke to a number of real estate developers. Again, we're talking about the United States capitalist framework, and real estate developers are like, but how am I supposed to get my 12% return on investment? How am I supposed to get my XYs? And so this is the, the ROI framework is really problematic. And then we met Ernst, and who is a Haitian American immigrant who experienced things and from a lived experience point of view. And he is um Marissa, please, sorry. Oh, sorry. Or maybe it's on the phone. Um, who is uh, very outspoken, socially justice minded real estate developer, which is not a, com a common combination that you get. And so when we met him, he said, okay, this is fantastic. I totally get it because his mother had just passed away, actually. Um, and he saw the conditions of isolation and so forth, and so he invited us to do, develop Care House in Baltimore. So he's essentially putting up the equity, we're figuring out the systems. There's different ways to, again, different small ways to provide um, private sector uh, support and combine it with public sector deport, uh, support. We're in conversation with um, lawmakers and policymakers in Baltimore to make this happen as well as possibly um, other philanthropists. But really we've, this first model is we're, we're creating it so it's self-sustaining um, and we're creating a model that works. And then, we, but we are also seeing the ways that, you know, not everybody's gonna have such an, a wonderful third partner to work with. And so we're really mindful about crafting ways to scale it that in, can engage and leverage public sector and private sector investments. 
And, and what typically happens in Canada, for instance, if you start talking about co-housing, um, if, if, if you try to build co-housing, there's no bank that is going to actually lend you for co-housing. You have to create first a non-for-profit or an association so that you can get that, um, that initial resource. But another piece that, that we've been seeing in Canada more and more, and that it's also emerging in the U.S., are community land trusts. Like building on community land trusts so that that's um, uh, basically land that is uh, stewarded by the community and they decide what is the type of housing or the type of infrastructure that is needed in that specific space. And then uh, with different subsidies. So what would happen if, for instance, if it would be unlocking city land or um, land from churches or community land trusts and then pairing this up with non-for-profit developers and maybe also with subsidy from crown uh, organizations. But in order for this to happen, there would, be, there would need to be policies in place that actually are speaking to the, these different possibilities and that are aligned with the financial models that are going to allow to lend the money and the financial infrastructure to make that happen. So that's a, that's a great question, and it's a big one that we need to solve in Canada because things are not black and white. We need to navigate the gray spectrum. Uh, I'll just add to that that New Cities hosted a, a, a housing uh, conference in 2019, and we had in New York we had workshops devoted to various themes, one was on co-housing, and at the table were both representatives of Fannie Mae and CMHC, both of whom were uni in unison, and be like, we can't finance this. What, what is this model? Like, who, who owns this? So it was really fascinating to watch these institutional players basically just throw up their hands in the air rather than try to actually solve it with us. So great. Lev, let's go to the online questions. Yeah. Uh, and just a, a petit rappel, if you have a question in French, we're here to translate, uh, or to hand you the microphone, depending on what you prefer. Um, so one question was just answered. It was about the economic model. And the other from uh, Melissa Lee Colbert. Is the design model you're creating with CareHouse open source uh, to make it available for other cities' developers? Have any cities expressed such interest? If, to, to understand if, if it's uh, available to to, to replicate or to... Yeah, I think in the context of like what Alejandra Aravena has done with an elemental with the half-built housing where those models were put out open source. You know, it's, um, the, the model is based on a certain interaction with, uh, with a community that is in place. So, right, it can't end in a certain urban typology of what kind of houses or buildings are, are on the street and how people live and the climate and, and the habits of, of, of the neighborhood and all that. So it, it can't really be uh, replicated, nor is, is it the idea, it's not the modernist kind of slab building that gets kind of repeated everywhere at the same. It does seek to be specific to site, uh, specific to the social fabric, specific to the urban fabric. So it does require um, that, that engagement on ground. And this is why it's taking so long. Uh, I mean, it's not taking that long as a building, but it, part of the process, you know, this has been in design for two years because a lot of that has to do with working with, with community members, working with the city, working with the neighborhood. I will say that there's a few takeaways that we have. I mean, Rafi and I are frequently publishing about the project. We're publishing a book that comes out um, that includes some of our takeaways, but I, just to echo what Rafi's saying, there's this, you know, the element or this key principle of self-determination and, and, and housing is something on the one hand, you, it's more about taking the insights for other people to um, create themselves. I mean, like the policy paper we created is available online, for example. Yeah. yeah. Great. We have time for, I think, one last question then. Please. Hi. Sorry, I missed the first few presentations, so apologies for that. But I have a, a general question, an observation from, like Greg, I'm a relative newcomer to Quebec, um, originally from Toronto via New York and, and now to Montreal. We were very excited, my wife and I, um, coming to, with some of the social promises of the province with childcare and so forth, but discovered a kind of unforeseen consequence of some of the, uh, of the, the newest, I guess, uh, affordable daycare, um, which is that it's actually removing choice. And that we actually saw it before our eyes as the, um, some of the new affordability and expansion of the program came into place. There was, as that curve went up, the other, there was another curve that was going down, and that was basically neighborhood-based, self-organized options. And it was really, it was a very uh, debilitating thing because 
you know, literally these play groups that had been instituted for, for, for decades were just evaporating, boom, boom, boom. Um, we tried to put our son in, in a daycare part-time. No, no, you can't do that. It's full-time or nothing. Um, and so this idea of diverse options for care were just sort of being, in a sense, swept away by um, some of these, you know, well-meaning uh, offerings. And so I think there's a sort of a thread perhaps moving through some of these ideas, which is when does the um, promotion of, say, a state solution uh, really remove diversity from, um, you know, across the board and different ideas of care. Thank you, Scott, for that question. And I, I want Rafi to take this first because this is sort of briefly at the end here touch upon the fact that Care House was also featured at the Venice Architecture Biennale as part of a, part of a station there that I was also fortunate to be joined within. But Rafi sort of frames some of that work there as, you know, the, the modernist project, the state was the client, and then of course the markets have been the client under neoliberalism, and is there a new type of client that we could make and what that client would be, some sort of indeterminate, I don't know, Rafi, that's a good framing, but that's what I hear there, uh, where uh, the failures of the market and the failures of the state, does it create an open space, whether well, yeah. by necessity or by choice? Uh, who, who takes responsibility for the public realm? right, and kind of modernism uh, and with invention of the state. So the state said it represented the public. It built housing, it built school, it set up an educational system, right? And this is, we still inherited this idea of, of a public that's coming from this kind of the modernist movement in that sense, right, the enlightened kind of state that does for the public. But then we ran out of public money uh, and, and, and private, and kind of private, uh, the private sector is, is taken over and the question is, um, do we explore, or is there a project, which I believe in, to explore a different, uh, a client is easy to understand as architects because we're used to kind of providing services, but maybe a user, um, which is not private, but is also not the state, nor the city or municipality, uh, but a group, a community, a neighborhood, um, a self-organized group, or a group that there are mechanisms to help them organize. And that's the potential, I think. And this I talked, I started my first response about the scale, about the ability of democracy also at large maybe to survive in, in the right scales, right? Uh, or, or the existence of multiple scales that allow self-determination, uh, that allow uh, that balance between control over our lives, but also being part of you know, a, a larger alliance. Yeah. And this is a project that impacts um, the, the way cities are organized and the way cities function and the way we, we design. So it's not only a project of designers, of course, but uh, this is why we need dialogue. And this is our book <laughs> that, is, uh, that is, will, will, will come out in a year's time about that, about the need for those dialogues to happen in order to create that solidarity, which we dare call it solidarity, um, and, and the ability of that solidarity to, to anchor itself in, in society through design. Because like Marissa said before, this is really right on, uh, architecture is the more permanent component that, that really anchors social patterns, right? Thank you. Any final questions? I think we have time for one more, perhaps. All right, here in the front, and then I will hand it back to our host to close the evening. Perfect, thank you. Uh, this is a very thought-provoking concept, and uh, I actually work in accessibility of metro stations, so it's basically about the stakeholders who will be living in care houses and how they actually move around the city. So how, as an architect and as an artist, are you incubating and ensuring organic social connections within a care house? That's a great question. This is what I, ask. I mean, the core of care house to me is not an architectural intervention so much as a programming one and creating the actual culture and, fa and co yeah, the, fab the social fabric of care house. And how do you build that from scratch? I, uh, so one way of responding to that question is that um, our there's this question that we often receive about how do we select for the residents who are, and part of it's, it's co-housing is not for everybody. I'll, I do wanna mention again, everybody has their own independent unit and their shared spaces. At the same time, it's not, it is not for everybody. 
one of our key partners in Baltimore that also has 40 different nodes throughout the United States is um, Sarah Santon and her initiative that's out of Johns Hopkins called Capable. And they work with uh, low income, older and disabled adults to en enable them, empower them to meet their own mobility goals. Um, so they have a very granular understanding about who, what kinds of people are best poised to benefit from living in a care house situation. Um, and they're one of our key um, stakeholders in terms of this pipeline process. We also have um, relationships with other community-based organizations. And so it's very much this conversation of like ensuring this process. Um, and we have, I mean, really a fantastic and strong network of people who are involved in all the programs. So for example, um, one block away is this initiative called Open Works that has uh, the United States' largest maker space, and they already have a senior maker facility where they have 65 seniors who are really active members and making things. Um, so there, that's a really felicitous um, partnership. Yeah, yeah I, it, the programs that come into the building, but really before the, the structure is up, uh, and, and there are different time frames, people that the residents that are going to live in the building are going to meet before even the building is ready so there's a there's an idea of creating the community of residents uh, before the building is there and not just have a house and throw people in so that's also a process this is why it's such a process it involves so many partners from, from art, and we didn't even talk about the nutrition uh, and food system and, and bringing kind of a chef once a week. So there's, there's a lot of partners that are engaged, and it's, it's kind of a pretty complicated logistics to, to get these kind of things in order, but that's, that's the goal. If I may quickly add, there's, there's one piece that we can also consider that is, that, that's emerging, that is new, and, uh, and the Happy City team uh, is a consulting firm in Vancouver, has been doing an amazing job. Uh, they created the Happy Homes Toolkit, and this displays an array of design options that can actually help bring people together, and these are grounded in studies from neuroscience, sociology, environmental psychology, and what are the spaces that actually nurture um, social connections. Uh, we know that people are more prone to, for instance, l linger when there's uh, sunlight. So how do you create this kind of spaces? We also know what you were talking about, Marisa, like if you t talk to Latinx community, they're gonna be more comfortable being closer together. And there's our studies, for instance, that show that while people from Latin America, like for instance, in, in my case, like we're very comfortable pe talking with people in a 40 centimeter distance. But uh, according to studies, North Americans feel comfortable with, within 70 centimeters distance. So just understanding what are these like subtleties about the design of space and that we can incorporate not as a, as a rule of thumb, but as a parting point to analyze how your own community is going to be adapting to that, that kind of like array of, of elements or design opportunities that, that the team has created. And that's a start point. Wonderful. All right, well, with that, I may ask for a round of applause for our panelists in response. <laughs> Can I, and, and of course, I want to throw it back to our host here for final remarks. Lev. Well, actually, not final remarks, but we have one, one more question oh, online from, from kind of a special person, oh, uh, right. Phyllis Lambert. So um, if you don't mind, bear, I, I think it's a nice question. Anything um, she asks. Was, this, uh, was the budget considered a renovation or a new build or somehow both? Basically, how did you deal with the regulations? What kind of um, regula regulations did uh, apply to it? Um. This, uh, Baltimore is a new construction. Uh, it's, in a, um, it's in a zone. There is um, a vision plan prepared with the community, and it's in a zone of uh, kind of economic development zone. Uh, so we're, and, and a zone which we call in, in urban planning terms uh, uh, transit. So there's this transit oriented, for example. So there is like bus roads and all that. Um, so whatever we're doing is, is allowed and it's rental, it's rental units. Um, so there's no really uh, exceptions here. Uh, we did develop models uh, for care house being uh, a, a renovation of a cluster of floors in a tower or, or in a larger building. So there are other models that are on paper developed. But in this case, it's 21 units. Um, they're all 
rental units, the shared spaces is managed by the care house, so it's, um, it's kind of like any co-housing project would work. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It's possible. There's no, nothing kind of unique uh, in terms of, uh, of codes about it. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Lambert, for your question. We're honored by your presence this evening, so thank you for watching. All right. Well, on that note, now another round of applause for our, for our speakers. Thank you. And any concluding remarks from Lev or from Givara, or shall we call it just, evening? Well, I was just going to say thank you, merci beaucoup, uh, tout le monde. Merci encore à notre invité. Thank you so much for coming. Many of you traveled far to be here. Um, and uh, just a reminder that uh, the exhibition is open. Uh, it's a lovely way to see the project and other, many other projects uh, from tomorrow at 11. We're always free for students, just a reminder. Um, and yeah, merci encore. Bonne soirée. <laughs>